Welcome to the moment that changed everything, where we interview notable creative people to gain insights into how they got started and learn more about the moments that shaped them and their careers. Today we sit down with David Shore. David is a Canadian writer with a spectacular career in television. Trained as a lawyer, Shore worked on Family Law, NYPD Blue and Due South, as well as the critically acclaimed series House, and more recently Battle Creek, Sneaky Pete, and The Good Doctor. In terms of reach, David's show House, where he is creator, executive producer, writer, and Emmy Award winner, reached 16 million households weekly. In 2018, David received an honorary degree in law from the University of Western Ontario. Ironic for a television writer who's produced two of the most successful medical dramas. David joins us from Muskoka, where he shares his insight on character development, who Dr. Gregory House is based upon, and the difference between a whodunit and a why done it. David, welcome to the moment that changed everything. We're thrilled you could be here. David Shore is a writer, creator, executive producer, um, Emmy Award winner, and actor in one of my favorite films, Meatballs. <laughs> David, welcome to the moment that changed everything. I assume this is going to be all about meatballs, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is entirely about your performance in Meatballs, which is it uncredited or is it credited? <laughs> It is uncredited, and, and so it should be uncredited. Uh, one of my writers on one of my shows decided to add my add that entry to IMDb. So if you look me up on the Internet Movie Database, you will see it credited there, but it's not really credited in the movie. Um, I did look you up on IMDb, and it goes on and on and on. You have more credits than everyone. Um, yeah. So tell me, you started off in London, Ontario. You did a law degree at U of T. How did you get into where you are now? Um, I don't know. Um, it's not, you know, most people who, who write or generally in the entertainment business say it was their dream since they were young. Uh, I don't know if I'm an ass for saying this, but it wasn't. Um, it never even... It wasn't not my dream because I'd rejected it or anything. It was just, you know, I grew up in London, Ontario. My dad was an accountant. My mother had been a nurse. It, nobody was in the entertainment industry. I mean, nobody I knew was in the entertainment industry. It didn't even occur to me. It's not something I thought about and rejected. It literally never even occurred to me. And then when I was in law school, a friend of mine was planning after he graduated to move to LA to write. And it was kind of like, oh, you can do that. People do that. And that just planted a seed, although it was many years later before I, I actually made the move. But it, it started stewing in my head and I started thinking about things and uh, eventually did make the move. Well, so a lot of the people that are watching this show, first of all, you're the first entertainment person we have, you know, that purely from the entertainment business. Um, do you still maintain your law degree? Are you a member no, of the bar? No, I, um, I let it lapse. I, I, at a certain, I, I kept paying my dues and I kept filing the forms for many, many, many years. The forms would, I'd fill out saying, although I'm not practicing, I'm working on the TV show Law and & Order and therefore uh, I am exercising my legal skills and therefore should I come back to law, I shouldn't have to retake the bar exams or anything like that. And they were okay. And then at a certain point I got... I felt, I'm, I don't think I'm going back. I felt <laughs> secure enough that I wasn't going back. Um, at what point did you think you weren't going to go back? Um, how many shows have you done up until that point? Quite a few. I mean, it was, you do, like the entertainment, like when you, no job is completely secure. But if you, when you're a lawyer and you get a job, you hope or you can imagine that you may stay at that firm for the rest of your life, theoretically. If all goes well, if you like them and they like you, you will stay there forever. That is a possibility. In the entertainment industry, best case scenario, you're looking for a new job in a few years. You know, um, crazy, crazy success, you stay with the show for eight years. That's crazy, that never happens. Usually you're just every two or three years or every six months, you're looking for a new job and that's just the way it is. And you're also, because of that, I guess, what we all have, which is a certain amount of, um, you know, we all think we're frauds on a certain level. We all think we, you know, we're gonna be found out tomorrow. 
Is I that from law do. or that's from entertainment? And so, and well, in entertainment, it's all the more aggravated, I think, because because you need to prove yourself to new people every time. And so you, I, I can remember doing the math in my head, like if nothing, like when I was on Law and Order or something like that, I was going, I think I'm okay for another two years. I think I can keep this job going and I think I can parlay that into another job. But if things don't go well, that could be the end of it. And then when House Me hit, I remember upping it to, I think I'm okay for another five years or so. Um, that was probably the maximum. Now I'm, I'm okay. So okay. when you said when House hit, how many episodes had you done? Oh, it was, um, Late in the first season, I think that it became. Um, we were doing okay at the beginning. There's kind of a myth out there that you know, with a, within certain aspects of the industry, that um, that we were on the bubble at the beginning, as they say, that we we were we were possibly going to get canceled even after we start airing. We weren't doing great. Our numbers weren't great. Our viewership wasn't great, but it was better than anything else on Fox. And you know, you just have to do better than the other guy. I, I figured they have to cancel all their other shows before they can cancel us. And um, so it went well. And then they started, they started daring us after American Idol um, in the second half of our season. And our numbers shot up when that, American Idol was the biggest thing on TV at the time. Our numbers shot up right after that, when that happened. And, and they called us up thrilled because we had retained 43% of the American Idol audience, which was apparently very good. We were on right after it and we had less than half their audience, but apparently that was good. That's how big that show was. And then the next week it was like 45% and then 48%. And then by the end of the year, we were retaining 90% of the American Idol audience. Um, and you know, it's going, we might beat them. I don't think that, that never happened, I don't think. But we got very close. And, um, and so at that point I'm going, okay, we're, we're on the air for a while. Um. Of all the shows you've done, which is the one that you're perhaps most proud of? Or are they all children and you're proud of them all? <laughs> um, they're all children. They're, um, but no, they're not. They're not all created equally. Um, House, House, I think, is particularly special. I, I don't want to not say The Good Doctor. It's also up there. Um, those are the two shows that I created and went a little bit and uh, and created kind of on my own and so there there might be and house was the most personal house was house was me getting up on a soapbox every week and spouting my views of the universe through this character and having people listen to me that was um that was particularly wonderful so that was really you? I, I'm very hesitant to say that, but to some extent it was. Um, I mean, it's not literally me. I'm not nearly as smart as uh, Dr. House was, <laughs> but those were generally the points of view that I don't have the guts to say, you know, the thing, well, sometimes I do say those things and now I can get away with it to some extent. It doesn't strike me like this is something that you would say to people something you may think about, but not something you'd say. Well, that was kind of the inspiration for him was it's kind of the ass, you know, so many people say nasty things about people after they leave the room, often appropriately so. And House was the one who didn't wait till he left the room. Um, it was at the, but yeah, those are a lot of my thoughts um, as my wife can vouch. Um, <laughs> so, if, and so. it, was, it was kind of, there was never a good time to say this because at the beginning he was just kind of viewed as the asshole at the center of this show. And so when people ask me, you know, who's that based on, I'd say, it's me, I'm saying I'm an asshole. And then it became worse when he became the sex symbol. Then I'm going, yep, that sexy guy at the middle of the show, that's me. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, but, but the show's been off the air long enough. I guess I can say it now. I, um, I certainly, What's that? How many have you written? How, how many shows have you written for House? You were on for how many years? Seven years? Eight years? 
I, it went for eight years. I had a very excellent and very large writing staff that supported me, but that, I have always viewed that as the job is the writing, is making sure that the scripts are what they should be. 90% of my job is as executive, as executive producer. You, you see the, you know, your audience sees the producer credits on TV. They're meaningless. I, every show is different and they generally mean almost nothing. And you certainly can't extrapolate anything from somebody being a producer. But um, in my case, 90% of the job was writing. And so I either wrote or rewrote to a greater or lesser extent, every single one of the 177 scripts. Oh my gosh. Now, so if you said that's 90% of your, of, um, of your responsibility, keeping, I guess, the show fresh and interesting so people will watch, and obviously did for eight years, um, but you're managing a massive budget. You know, each show's got to cost, yeah. I'm guessing, five, six million dollars each. You're doing 13 of them a year. It's uh, a massive business. Well, in House's case, we're doing 24 a year. 24, okay, um, so much bigger. Um, and those numbers are, when we were at our peak, the budget got a little out of control because the network, the studio was just throwing money at us, whatever we wanted to do, we could do. And they were, everybody got big raises. And so uh, at our peak, our, our budget was, yeah, close to $6 million an episode US. So serious. Like, okay, let's say you didn't go to the States, you still continued your writing career. You were now in Canada writing a show. What would the budget be? I actually don't know what the budgets are in Canada. I know they're, well, that, by the way, that was crazy, even now. Most shows nowadays, I mean, HBO spends like crazy on their shows, but most network shows aren't as expensive as what I just said. Um, and that's why a lot of them shoot in Canada, actually, is they save money that way. They get some tax breaks. And to be honest, the wages are lower. Um, and the crews are great. Um, so a lot of shows come up to Canada for that. I don't know what Canadian show costs. I know when I did Traders, um, which was a while ago now, you know, it was over 20 years ago. Um, I think it was over 20 years ago. Uh, yes, it was. Um, it, we were spending less than a million dollars Canadian per episode. Um, of your budgets? I don't know where we spend the money. I don't know why it's such a big difference. I don't get it. Really? And yet you control the budget. Is it mostly from labor, actors, fees? Um, large chunk of that is what they call above the line. Um, I, I sign off on the budget. I, as I said, I don't pay a lot of attention to it. People, other people are paying attention to it. I let somebody drop a budget. I look at it, make sure it's right. And then we try and deliver episodes at that number. Um, some of them are higher, some of them are lower. I deliver a script and then somebody tells me we can't for that money. And I go, what do we need to change? Or, or I say, we're not changing anything. Okay. So David, partway through house, you changed the cast almost. Was the reason a budgetary reason? Uh, Steve Jobs asked me that question. How about that? That's really? kind of cool. And you got to meet Steve. Yeah. Jobs. Awesome. <laughs> I did not get to meet. I got to speak to Steve Jobs. Um, one night I was in my office and my assistant comes in and says, Steve Jobs is on the phone and I went to the Steve Jobs and my assistant went, I'll check. <laughs> and he went out, he went out and came back. Um, and, uh, it was Steve Jobs on the phone. I spoke to him for like 15 minutes and basically wanted to say he was a fan and he wanted to, he asked me why we were. Changing things. He asked me if it was a creative or a financial reason, and I told him it was a creative reason, which is yeah. which is the right answer, um, and is what it was actually. Um, uh, when the Wasn't show that started, a risky time? wasn't that an incredible? Was that, risky move? Wasn't that a risky move? I suppose I'd already, you know. Yeah, um, it is and it isn't. I mean, you can also say there's a risk in not changing anything. Um, but yes, yes. I mean, the audience loves the status quo. You kind of want to give them the illusion of change without doing it. Um, I just, I was already dealing with the proverbial house's money. Well, actually, there's a pun there. I didn't mean it. Um, 
you know, I was, um, the, the show had already been way more successful than I'd ever imagined. Uh, I didn't, you know, if I went two or three more years, that was great. And I think partially because of my law degree, it's always, been, I always knew I had something to fall back on even then, you know, I'd always come in. My, my the big thing was, I'm going to write what I want to write and hope for the best. And if the audience doesn't like it, they're entitled to not like it, but I'm not going to write things that I'm not excited about. Do you think your writing's improving? <laughs> um, Are you more comfortable with it? Does it come easier? Do you imagine a flawed character and can, you know, believe it faster or quicker or it's easier to handle? I think I'm getting better at identifying where the issues are and what the issues are. The job remains extremely difficult and exhausting, um, as so many jobs do. I mean, I don't want to, believe me, I, I've got the greatest job in the world. I don't want to sound like I'm complaining about it, but solving the problems is still, um, is still challenging. It's still very challenging. It never gets... Aspects of it get easier, but the job overall doesn't get easier. And I'm getting older, so I've got less energy for it. Um, but you still love it. There's an old saying that um, writers hate writing, but love having written. I, I think that would summarize it quite well. So, David, the, the moment, the day to day work is. It... So, we've been locked down for four months. What are you doing every day? Is it new shows? Is it new ideas? New characters? Um, I'm writing. I'm, I'm get... Well, The Good Doctor season four is supposed to start filming in a few weeks. Uh, that is the plan. And uh, hopefully nothing will change that. But in this environment, who knows? Um, so I've got an entire writer's room that I meet with pretty much daily. It used to be most of the day on a Zoom call like this, um, but with a dozen faces or so. And we talk about where we want to take the characters. We talk about the medical stories we want to, we want to explore, talk about what will be up first. Um, and, and then we go from there. Um, so at, we're at the point in the season where I've got a bunch of people working on various episodes. I'm right now co-writing the first two episodes. So emails are going back and forth between me and another writer as we exchange our product. <clears throat> um, the next episode, um, uh, an outline was done and has been approved by the network and uh, they're working on that script. So I will see that script in the next little while and I will give them notes on that. The episode after that, um, I just received an outline of that last night. I will review that, let them know where I think they're going right, where I think they're going wrong and we'll meet about that. The one after that has an outline about to come to me, but they want to see that other one, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The story document for the eighth episode I also just got, uh, which is less than, it's just like a few pages long, describing the themes we want to explore in that episode, which are things we've talked about, but it's, a, it's an actual document at this point. So there's a lot of documents going back and forth. It starts with an idea, then it becomes, you know, few pages, then a beat sheet, then an outline, then a script, and each time we discuss it and review, and uh, hopefully it gets better each time. You're about eight shows ahead? Uh, define ahead, yeah. I mean, I've got this schedule here, which uh, I won't show you because somebody will download it, but it's, um, <laughs> the fact is, in terms of the, you know, the scripts come out, we're just writing right through the whole year and the scripts come out just before we go into product, just before we go into pre-production. We've got uh, seven or eight days of director prep. And so the scripts actually get delivered to the production office just before that. And then, uh, and then there's a week and a half of pre-production, a week and a half of filming, and then a few weeks of editing. And we, the writer's room remain just barely out of that throughout the season. Where does the, idea come from for the flaws for your characters? Oh, I wish I had um, a more specific answer. Um, I'm just not interested in perfect people. 
um, there aren't perfect people and I don't want to write those. Um, I, you know, in the case of House, it was from Sherlock Holmes um, a little bit and my own stuff, as I said, but there's a lot of Sherlock Holmes in there. What I'm interested in in writing, and this is connected to that, what I'm interested in in writing is not like on the, I've done two medical shows and I'm not, the medicine doesn't interest me. What interests me is the ethical dilemmas that characters face and what is the right thing to do? What is the wrong thing to do in any situation? I think, I think almost all of us are looking to do the right thing. That doesn't mean we do it. And that doesn't mean we ever know what it was, but I do think there's the right thing. And different perspectives create different views of that. And, and that's, that just creates, I'm just interested in writing real people and real people make mistakes. Um, I wish I had a better answer. I wish I had a word, but so the character. Just, I just look, what interests me? What interests me? So your lead character in The Good Doctor, how do you write for that? It was very, it, it, was, um, it was a scary thing at the beginning, because uh, this is a character who could easily be a cartoon, a caricature of what it means to be, to, to live life with autism. Um, and that's not what we wanted. We want to, wanted a real person who has difficulties and strengths like the rest of us, but just a little more acute or obvious. Um, but there were specific things about that character that we wanted to dramatize, but we didn't want it. We didn't want it to, it could have just been so terrible. I, I'm, I'm babbling a little bit. The short answer to this is Freddie Highmore. Um, when I met Freddie, we talked about this very issue and he was coming from the same direction and he's a great actor. And our director of the pilot, Seth Gordon, did a great job of guiding him, but Freddie is just such a talented actor and such a sensitive human being and a real grown up, a real pleasure to work with. Um, I don't think that, you know, if you have a chance to work with him on anything, I don't care what it is. You know, if 40 years from now something happens and Freddie's working in a McDonald's, I hope that doesn't happen. With all due respect to working at McDonald's. But if you get a chance to work at that McDonald's, McDonald's, take the job. You won't be sorry. <laughs> when you wrote um, um, The Good Doctor, did you have him in mind? No, no. Um, I, I, did, I tend to write, a lot of writers write with people in mind. I tend to write without anybody in mind. I tend to just write the character and not write the actor. This actor will be good at this. I just write a character. Um, and then we started auditioning people and the network and the studio both mentioned Freddie. And um, I watched some of his work and was really impressed with him. But then I met with him and that, and he just, it was, um, I've been lucky enough to have that experience twice. And most people don't have it ever in my industry where I've, I've had the chance to work with uh, with an actor, a lead actor who makes my work better, who sees and and sees things the same way I do, but complements my vision, and I hopefully complement their vision. Hugh and I saw the character of us the exact same way, and quite often that's not the case between the creator and the star. I'd say more often than not, but it just was wonderful, and it's been wonderful with Freddie as well. Um. You're obviously ensconced in television. What about streaming? How is this going to affect what you might do in the future? Oh, it's changing everything in ways that I don't like to think about, um, which is probably not good for this. Um, I hate to be an artist, you know, but I, I, I'm, I'm a writer and I like writing stories and I really don't care how they're delivered to the audience. I like having an audience, the bigger the audience, the better. Um, I don't care if you know my episodes in the future are 70 minutes long or 50 minutes long or 40 minutes long, um, but I want them of a certain length and I want them to a minimum length and probably a maximum length too. And, and I want people to see it and I want it done in a quality way, but I just want to keep telling stories.
So you're just looking at them yeah, as it's a, changing the industry like crazy. It's a delivery system more than anything. Yeah. 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 Um, do you have an idea for what your next show might be? <laughs> I should, but I don't. I never do. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take before you, from house to come up with a good doctor? Well, I worked on a couple in shows in between. Right. Yeah. Um, I did, I did a, a pilot that didn't go on the air, which I still feel bad about because I really thought that was a good show uh, called Doubt. It, was, it had a great director and a great star and a great cast and, I, and a pretty good script. And I thought, and I should have been on the air. And, then, you know, you do what you can. It's not my decision ultimately, and that's that. And then I did, um, I did uh, Battle Creek. Um, which was based on a Vince Gilligan script. That was a lot of fun. That was on the air for a year. And I did Houdini and Doyle, which I produced, which was also a lot of fun. And then several people sent me this Korean show called The Good Doctor. This, the, the Good Doctor is based on a Korean series. And I watched the first episode and went, I want to do that. And um, this, my studio was quite happy to hear I wanted to do a medical show for some reason. <laughs> and um, it's worked out. Did House start out as a medical show? Yeah, it started out as a medical show without House, kind of. Um, it was, um, I was teamed up with some other people to develop a series for um, Universal, some producers. Um, and they wanted to do a medical mystery show, one of them. And I didn't like the idea that much. Um, but they did, and they were much better connected than I was, and they went out and kind of sold it. And so they come back and go, yay, we sold the pilot. And the pilot at that point was literally, it's a medical mystery. I mean, the, the pitch was about eight seconds long. And this is not the way Hollywood ever works, but it did that day. And so I had my choice to either get on board a done deal or, or say, I don't want to do this. And I, I chose the cowardly route uh, and got on board the done deal. And, um, but I spent a lot of time try, trying to figure out how to make it something I wanted to do. I, it's not that I was against that idea. I just, by itself, it seemed, because it was sold as a what done it. Um, so that like, literally it was- What is the, the a what I was working with told the network executives, it's not a who done it, it's a what done it. What is a what done? And the problem is, it's a what done it. We don't really watch who done it's, and we definitely don't watch what done it's. We watch why done it's. When somebody says the butler did it, they nobody cares that the person who works as a butler did the crime. They care that the butler killed somebody because their boss was having an affair with their wife, or whatever the reason is. That's what we care about. We care about why they did it. And germs don't have motives. That was my big problem with a show about, about germs, about uh, me, you know, what's wrong with them medically. Interesting short story, interesting movie maybe, but episode after episode, trying to make that interesting was a challenge I couldn't see myself meeting. And so, I thought about that and thought about that and thought about that. And the answer to me was, I don't make it about the germs. I make it about the people who are sick and about the people who are solving them, which is a typical, you know, it's always about the people who are solving, them, but make it about the, the diagnosis in almost every single episode, the ultimate diagnosis came about because House or somebody in his team figured out some personal secret about the person what they were lying about, what they were kidding themselves about. And that led to some realization, which led to the cure. It wasn't about putting them in an MRI machine and finding the disease. It was about figuring out this patient and thus figuring out what the disease was. It was always about the characters. I mean, everybody lies was the, the slogan of the show and figuring out why, what a person is lying about and lying in the broadest sense, they could be deceiving themselves that was almost always the key to solving the case. So it was always about the patient, not about their illness. So Hugh Laurie and Freddie Highmore notwithstanding, are there any other actors you enjoy working with all the time? Um, 
yeah um you know the guy almost all of them um and i hate to give a list because then the people that aren't on it will feel bad um it's an ensemble cast that you enjoy yeah i enjoy the ensemble cast and and they've it, you know most people are decent people and um dr house may disagree with me on that um well he's they're decent but stupid he would say uh, perhaps um well, I get to decide what he would say. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I've been very fortunate. I, I've worked with some really talented, nice, good people. Um, you know, Josh Dumel, Dean Winters were great there. Um, uh, you know, Michael and Stephen, Houdini and Doyle were fantastic. Um, going all the way back to do South, I've worked with real, with actors that were just a pleasure to work with. Um, and you don't really know what's next. I really don't. I really don't. <laughs> do any of your I, kids this have keeps, this keeps me busy. This keeps me busy right now. I don't have to think about what's next. Do your kids have aspirations of doing what you're doing? Yeah. Uh, I've got three kids. My two sons, um, uh, my older son is a recent graduate of NYU Film School. He would like to write or direct. Uh, my younger son uh, wants to go to film school. Uh, he's going to be a senior in high school this year. And uh, a very, he, was, he was interviewing at a high school. And he told them, uh, we were not in the room. I heard about it afterwards. He told the person he was interviewing with that he wants to, uh, he wants to study film like his brother. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, so didn't mention me. <laughs> However, you didn't. Uh, really but I think he film. would like to. Right now, he'd like to be a cinematographer. So really? Director of photography. Yeah. And He's you very interested in the visual. And your youngest? They're both. They're both smart and talented. Oh. Uh, he's my youngest. The one in between, my daughter is uh, studying neuroscience and is interesting in all things um, criminal. She she wants to understand why criminals do what they do. So, I'm not sure where that will lead her, but there's a number of good options there. David, I can't tell you what a pleasure this has been. Um, thrilled that you were able to join us um, and uh, continued success. Thank you very much. It, it was great to see you um, and it was a pleasure talking to you. This episode has been brought to you by the National Advertising Challenge, North America's only brief-based challenge that sends winners to Cannes, France.